So it's me. Thanks, uh, thanks for coming out, and I, I appreciate that uh, that you're all still finishing, uh, you know, the coffee break. I've, I've got a coffee over there, but if I drink the coffee, it causes the microphone to get knocked off of my face. So I, I will, I will not be, uh, I'll not be drinking in front of you. Although probably if it was if it was a beer break, I think I would, I would just not care about the microphone anymore and, and just drink beer. But that wasn't a, that wasn't an option yet. I think that's later today. Um, so cool. So I'm gonna, I'm going to hopefully, uh, I'm gonna hopefully say uh, all sorts of uh, incendiary and, uh, and negative things and, and cause everyone to uh, to tweet angrily at me. Uh, I believe that people are already tweeting angrily at me um, due to yesterday's TC meeting, but uh, but maybe we can give you some more ammunition uh, to, to show how much you love me on the internet. So if you'd like to do that, my Twitter handle is is up there. I'm Ian underscore Monty. Uh, that seems to be how people uh, give feedback. Um, or if you just want to post a, a photo of a cat uh, and, and then say something funny about me, that's, that's cool too. Um, these slides, uh, if, you, if you decide that you, you like them, you want to show them to your, to your wife or your husband or, or whatever when you get home, uh, they're, they're on the internet. Uh, actually, I, have, I made a couple of changes this morning um, and I have not run get push yet. So, uh, so there is a version of these slides uh, at that link, um, but a couple of the slides will be in a different location, and you know, but I'll, I'll get around to doing Git push here uh, any, any minute. Um, finally, while I'm talking about the topic of talking about uh, topics, uh, uh, the, the source code for these is also in Git, as I might have just mentioned. You're free to clone it. Um, it's all Creative Commons licensed, uh, except I believe for any quotes that I have on the screen, because I do not own the copyright uh, to quotes from other people. Um, so the, the, the slides themselves are copyrighted that the content of the slides uh, itself might be uh, evil in some way. Um, sort of like, I might be evil, but that's okay. Uh, so I'm up here babbling. Um, that's a great, I suppose. Um, but you, it's possible you don't know me. Um, it probably, it's, it's certain you don't know me, because if you knew me, you wouldn't be sitting here in the, in the seats. Um, so I work for, uh, for International Business Machines. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of us. Uh, we do computers uh, and other things. Uh, amongst things in our history, uh, we've, we invented the automated traffic signal, uh, which I think is extremely important. Uh, otherwise, cars would you know, just run into each other, and nobody wants that. Uh, they've made me a distinguished engineer uh, there, which is uh, terrifying for the entire world of technology. Um, but uh, but I, I guess I guess that means something uh, positive. Uh, I also spend all of my time on OpenStack, uh, so I just run around saying OpenStack, 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 OpenStack to people. Uh, at least that's what my wife says that I do. Um, I sit on the OpenStack technical committee, um, which you again, if you follow Twitter things, uh, you might be aware of, uh, given yesterday's DC meeting. Uh, I also sit on the OpenStack Foundation board of directors. Um, uh, which is another vector uh, by which I can make people angry. Um, and, uh, and finally, I work on the OpenStack developer, the core team of the OpenStack developer infrastructure systems, uh, which is a third way in which I can, uh, I can, I can piss you off and, uh, and, and make things hard on you. So, uh, so hopefully I've, I've got enough, uh, enough ways in which I can, uh, I can bring pain, uh, misery, and suffering into your life, which, uh, which I believe is, uh, is clearly my, my intent. Um, I also, you may have noticed, tend to ramble uh, on any particular topic, and it's, uh, it's not uh, uncommon for me to not get to the end of the talk in the appropriate amount of time, um, because I just do this. Uh, so I've decided for this talk that I'm going to put the main points of the talk first, uh, and then, then I can just sort of ramble, and, and if, we get to, if we get all the way through it, great. If we don't, you've got the, you've got the main points. So, um, so let's get started. So number one, is Cloud Native good? Sure, yeah, it's great, fantastic. Uh, is not cloud native bad? No, nope, it's not. Um, do you need to write cloud native apps to use cloud? No. Nope. Uh, are you a bad person if you don't write cloud native apps? No, you are not. That's it. That's the basic thing that I want to get across here. I will say that in many more words. Uh, but if you if you take away nothing other than than, than those four things, uh, then I think we've we've had a successful day and uh, and we have all learned. Uh, drinking more beer, so yay! Um, all right. Anyway, uh, <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, so, so what is what is cloud native? Uh, it's a, it's a word that gets tossed around a whole bunch. Uh, I thought I'd give you uh, a few uh, a few potential definitions. Uh, walk through that a little bit, and we'll we'll talk about why it may or may not be uh, for you. 
uh, or, or useful or whatnot. Um, so first of all, uh, there's this wonderful quote um, from Information Week uh, that, that talks about what cloud native is and, and says, you know, it's, uh, that's, uh, it's in, a, in a world where cloud computing is ubiquitous, uh, they can be de developed on a cloud platform, deployed in different clouds, and, and I quite literally think that this Information Week quote does what my wife says that I do at these conferences, which is just to say the word cloud over and over again. Um, so in this case, the definition of cloud native is cloud, 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 um, uh, which is really useful. Um, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which are a wonderful set of people who do Kubernetes-related things, um, uh, say this in their mission statement. And I don't want to pick on other people's mission statements because uh, I have been involved in mission statements, and it turns out it's in entirely impossible to put together uh, uh, one that is that is clear and crisp. Um, but but in this particular case, Cloud Native uh, is going to harmonize emerging technologies and foster innovation. Uh, so I think it's good uh, that we're going to foster innovation. Nobody wants to to squash innovation unless you read Twitter things about me, apparently I do. Um, uh, and, and probably it's going to be container packaged, it's going to be dynamically scheduled, there's going to be microservices uh, involved in it, uh, and that's, uh, that, that's great. Like, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit clearer. That gives me a, a few more actual salient bullet points. Um, I'm going to, I'd like to, to sort of uh, put this into bullet point form rather than mission statement or, uh, or tech article thing. Uh, first of all, it's, it's an architectural and an operational approach. It, it defines both how you write and, and organize your software and how you deploy and run it, right? Um, the, both of those two things are, are affected if you, if you decide you want to do things cloud-native. Um, it, it does assume cloud. It would be really silly if it was cloud-native and it also did not assume cloud. Uh, it would be very poorly named, at least. Um, uh, it, it, in theory, assumes failures. Um, so there's a bunch of things, multiple copies of things, and load balancers, and auto failover, and, and stuff like that that you should build in there. Um, something with microservices, something containerized, people like to, to say that. We talked about that a lot this morning. In fact, saw the, um, uh, uh, you know, saw the, the resiliency of the, uh, of the, of the Kubernetes deploy uh, approach of thinking about things as, as all individual you know, units of, of pods that can be uh, contained. Containerized is, uh, is, is an interesting question. Um, there's a lot of people these days that sort of assume it has to be containerized. I would, I would argue with them. Um, I'm going to argue with them about a lot of things. Um, but I think I, I would argue that that's, that's a thing that um, uh, should be up for, for debate. But most of the normal cloud native people would, would argue that it needs to be uh, containerized in order to be cloud native. Um, the, uh, the folks at Pivotal have this really nice uh, slide. This is one of the slides where, when I say these slides are, are, are uh, Creative Commons licensed, uh, this one not so much, because this isn't my slide, I just stole this blatantly from their, from their website. Um, so, uh, sorry for all of the people who are angry about that. Um, uh, but they sort of got this, this sort of stack of things. Uh, and there's a thing in particular that I, I would also would like to thank them for sticking our logo here. That's very nice, uh, it's, you know, not all the time. Uh, you don't necessarily see that in all of the slides where you have the next to the logos next to it. Um, but we've got we've got some, some different things here. We've got we've got some infrastructure, we've got some automation, um, and then we've got the applications uh, and platform that you're gonna run on top of that. And, and if you've got these nice little these nice little you know human icons uh, over on the left to show us the the, the gray ops people and the blue uh, dev people um, and sort of the the, the differentiation of uh, of their tasks, uh, and it's like to sort of keep in keep in mind that that sort of cultural uh, cultural fit that that's being uh, sort of shown there. Um, uh, and I, it, it's either the, the next slide or the slide after it. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna apologize in advance. Uh, I I decided to get um, uh, exciting this morning and and add a Václav Havel uh, quote into the talk, uh, which is either going to go very well or very poorly. Um, so when we get to that point. Uh, uh, it's, uh, let's, let's hope that that goes uh, properly. Um, anyway, uh, so from the, from the Cloud Foundry people as, as well, um, uh, they're really big into this. Uh, one of the best definitions of, uh, of uh, Cloud Native that I think that's really specific uh, is the 12-factor application. In fact, you'll, you'll hear a lot of people use those two completely interchangeably. Like, it, it's, it can't be Cloud Native unless you've, unless you've done your, uh, your, your application in 12-factor manner. And, and in general, I think these are all really great ideas, right? Like, all, almost everything on this list um, is completely fantastic. Uh, you should, number one is a really good example. Your code should be in, in version control. If your code is not in version control, you have many other problems other than cloud. 
Uh, <laughs> please, please, for the love of God, put your code into version control. Uh, I would argue get, yeah, but like if you really want to do, you know, clear case or whatever it is that other people like to do, that's great. Um, you should you should probably deal with config. I'll talk about that in a second. But like a bunch of this stuff is, is good things. You should, they're good things to keep in mind, right? Um, uh, I, in fact, I, I suggest strongly going to 12factor.net. That's one two factor, not twelve spelled out. But to go to the twelve factor.net. Each one of these you can click on, and you can read like a big long thing. And we could, I'm sure, do an entire conference just on uh, on explaining twelve factor applications. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna dive into it, into it too much. But I just want to point out that it has been annotated, and, and there's some really good practices um, in here. So this is this is absolutely fantastic, right? Um, I don't really like three. Uh, personally, uh, number three in the 12 factor says that you should store all of your config and environment variables. Um, and that, that seems kind of strong to me, like that's, that's not really how, how I deal with config, um, uh, at least not in any of my uh, cloud applications, but, but apparently somebody else thinks that's really important, so they put it into a list, so I guess I uh, am that cloud. Um, in some sort of way. Um, uh, six is also says it has to be stateless, right? So, so if all your stuff has to be cloud native, then none of your stuff should store any data, um, uh, or at least it should it should use an external service to, to store the data. Um, so that's great, unless you're the person running the external service that needs to store the data. Um, in which case, then your external service itself can't be cloud native because it needs to be stateless. Um, uh, so uh, I, I hope that everybody has seen the, the wonderful MongoDB um, thing. Uh, if you haven't, I, I highly recommend going and, and Googling uh, the phrase MongoDB as web scale. Uh, this is not to pick on MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB is a great piece of technology, um, uh, but the, the cartoon uh, is, is quite funny and I think speaks to uh, the particular uh, concept that, um, uh, that, that is there at, at point. So, um, uh, so PEP8, uh, which is the Python style guide, uh, has, has this line in it. Foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. So you can go read Pep8. Um, uh, it's it's got lots of stuff in it, but but Guido put this in, or whoever actually I think it might not even Guido, uh, but they put this in to sort of remind you that these are guidelines, not absolute rules, right? Um, amusingly enough, uh, that is in fact a quote drawn from somewhere else. Uh, I, I'm not going to read the entire quote, but uh, if if you'd like to at some point uh, go, it turns out Ralph Waldo, Waldo Emerson. Uh, is the fellow uh, uh, from from back in, in English literature uh, who said this at the top of uh, at the top of a much longer thing, um, and, and what he's getting at sort of later on in here uh, is that is that you should you should say you should say the hard words today, and you should also say the hard words that are correct tomorrow, um, and they might be different. They might they might conflict with each other, um, but you you need to you need to dive into the hard situation on each day uh, and and deal with that. Um, and you know that that might not that might not work out for you really well every day, but completely uh, completely avoiding uh, the hard problems is is not particularly uh, a great way to to live your life. Um, so so cloud native and, and twelve factor I think are a fantastic approach, but they're they're a great approach, right? You you still have to think, and you still have to think about whether or not they make sense for for your application uh, and for how your your application is going to interact with. The internet with your users, with your business, and, and all of those sorts of things. And here's where I get in trouble. Um, so on the side of the building uh, out here is is this quote: um, uh, "The tragedy of modern man is that he knows less and less. Not that he knows less and less about the meaning of life, but that it bothers him less and less." Um, and the reason that I, I put that out is that I, I think that what I, I find these days uh, more and more in technology is is this: is the tragedy of modern technologists is not that he knows less and less about how computers work. But that it bothers them less and less. We we see more and more things trying to separate people who are writing computer code for a living from needing to understand the computer that runs underneath them. Ultimately, when you get into the hard problems that are at hand, you, you need to understand some of those things. Depending on what you're writing, maybe you don't. If you're writing the next Angry Birds, okay, you know, maybe maybe it's not important that you understand everything about the thing. But actually, Angry Birds got really, really popular. Um, and, and all of a sudden had some really hard scaling problems. And so probably there's some engineers there somewhere who needed to deal with those, those problems. So depending on who you are, depending on what you're doing, um, I, I, would, I would urge you to, to, at the very least, not just say, okay, well, if I adopt this one blueprint of how to do things, it will solve all of my problems, uh, and I won't have to think about them, um, and I can, I can just make billions of dollars uh, throwing uh, birds at sheep, um, or pigs, pigs, sheep, I can't remember. Uh, I didn't really run that much. So, um, 
Uh, so I want to talk about a couple of things that I, I do with cloud as it, as it relates to this and then how that relates to, uh, to cloud native things. So I think that having a cloud, um, and somebody said this this morning as well, like it's, it's, it's not just having a, a cloud is at the point, it's, it's your application, what you want to do with the cloud, right? How, how I'm going to use this to, to serve my customers and, uh, and my users, right? So for me, uh, as an application developer, I, I want to deploy and run an application on the internet. Uh, I, I'm not really big into things that don't run on the internet personally, that my, but this is just me. Uh, and so that my customers all over the world can consume it, right? Um, and, and also, and this is really important to me, as an operator of software that I probably also wrote, uh, I, I want to deploy that application across multiple clouds so that if I have an issue in one of the clouds, my service still survives, uh, uh, not just, uh, it turn, turns out that when, uh, when you can't watch, uh, when you can't watch uh, episodes of things, at least in the US, uh, I'm not sure how it works here, but um, uh, when there's an Amazon outage that causes uh, people to not be able to watch their Netflix, people get really, really uh, annoyed. Um, uh, and I, I think it's what, what, what they care more about is not whether or not it was the service provider upstream, but, but rather uh, can I watch the episode of Friends that uh, I'm really excited about watching. Um, so this is the thing that I do currently, um, and I, I do this, and there's actually other people in the audience here uh, as well that, that help me with this. Uh, we, we work, as I mentioned, on the OpenStack developer infrastructure. Um, we, we spin up and tear down between 10 and 20,000 VMs a day uh, in service of, uh, of the fine developers of OpenStack. Um, this is spread across 12, uh, 10 cloud regions that span seven clouds, um, which I think is, is a, a really great testament to OpenStack being, being pretty fantastic. And that's all done using nothing but the OpenStack APIs. Uh, as the people who, who, who support the project, uh, we find using things that aren't OpenStack uh, <laughs> to be strange. Um, uh, it's possible, possibly really important that we use OpenStack uh, to get things done, because then we can give feedback uh, to developers. So this is the, this is the OpenStack Infra team. Uh, as I mentioned, it's the tooling and automation. Um, our VMs are kind of spread out, uh, which I think is also really cool. We have, we have three different data centers worth of, of VMs from Rackspace. Uh, fine folks at Internap have, have given us some, uh, some VMs in their New York data center, uh, which amusingly enough the region code for is NYJ, so I believe it's actually in New Jersey, but they call it New York, which I'm sure both upsets the people in New York and New Jersey. Um, <laughs> it's not good for anybody. Um, there, there are two different uh, regions we have for, uh, for OVH, which is a European uh, OpenStack public cloud provider. Uh, based uh, based in France, and I cannot pronounce the name of, of those of those places appropriately, so I'm not going to try. Uh, uh, Vexhost is another cloud uh, provider for us. They're they're based in Montreal. Uh, the OpenStack Innovation Center is a is a joint venture between uh, Rackspace and Intel, and they've they've donated um, things, and I'm pretty sure that those uh, machines are in San Antonio. Although I could be wrong about that. Those are the public clouds. Those are just OpenStack public clouds who have donated resources to us. Uh, we also have a managed private cloud. Uh, from, from Bluebox, that, uh, that Bluebox donated to us, which is in San Jose. And uh, Red Hat is running, um, the team at Red Hat is running uh, a, a cloud uh, that, that we use to, uh, to test triple O things, uh, which I believe are in Phoenix. Um, we treat all of this as, as one big thing. Oh, also, I forgot about this and I shouldn't. Uh, we also have servers. Um, so Hewlett Packard Enterprises donated a couple of racks of servers in a data center, and we have a community effort to run OpenStack on that, also to put into the same, uh, the same pool of things. Um, so this is this is a sort of a simplified version of the architecture of what we've got going on here, um, and it's not how it works is not particularly important um, uh, in terms of what all of these pieces do. Uh, the thing that I want to point out, uh, there's a couple things I want to point out. You'll see these sort of gray boxes. Those are external services that we don't run that we have to interact with. These are a thing that show up in lots of architectures. You're like, well, you know, I'm going to do this, but I'm going to. I'm going to use you know Datadog or, or PagerDuty or or some sort of run uh, external managed service. Um, we have uh, we have some things that are they're sort of more normal nodes. They they sit there. We run. We we upgrade them. We we care for them. Um, uh, we have a set of things that are that are scale out. We've got 10, 12 of them, 14 of them. If one dies, we just make another one. Um, they're not really elastic in the sense that they're responding to demand because we don't need them to be. Um, but they're they're sort of more capacity planned scale out uh, architecture. And then sort of here in the middle, uh, there's two of them. Um, uh, partially because I, I lost the original source uh, of, of this image, uh, and, and so I'm just sort of, you know, gimping over top of it. Um, but that's actually where our, our seven clouds sit, and this is a completely dynamic, uh, dynamic thing. That stuff all works together uh, to, to make a coherent service, 
And the fact that some of these things are, are individual servers, some of them are scale-out servers, some of them are elastic uh, services, and some of them are external services, shouldn't be interesting to our end users, right? It, it should be, to them, they should be using the services that we're providing, uh, and we do the things we need to. Now, I want to call it two specific uh, pieces of this. Uh, uh, as, as by way of example. So one of the things we run is a thing called Garrett. It's where the code review and, and code sits in. Um, it could not possibly be more of a traditional enterprise Java application in tried. Uh, it, it's, it's big, it's, it's kind of monolithic, it sort of sits there. Uh, you scale it by getting a bigger machine, um, uh, you, you hopefully tune the JVM, uh, then you cry, um, you know, all of, all of those sorts of things go on um, with it. Uh, we run it on a Nova VM. Uh, we run it on a cinder volume, uh, and we have a trove database uh, that, that, that serves this. That's it. We, we treat it like it's running on a computer, and it's been running that way for four or five, year, five years now, I think. Um, it, it's a different VM than it was five years ago, but, um, but it's pretty much that. Um, we have a scale-out farm of Git replicas that, that replicate the Git uh, repositories that are inside of it, because it turns out that serving Git is actually a CPU-intensive task. Um, uh, and so it, it doesn't particularly scale to just have one monolithic Java application serving out Git replicas to, to, to 2,000 uh, developers. Um, it also has the, the wonderful quality that many, uh, that many traditional enterprise Java applications, uh, there are administrative tasks that we might want to perform on it at times that involve hours of downtime and there is nothing we can do about that. Um, so we schedule them in advance and we do them at best you know, once every few months, uh, but th they do that. We've talked in the past about, you know, how, how do we, so if I took this and I stuck it into a, into a Kubernetes, for instance, Kubernetes is fantastic. If I stuck this into a Kubernetes, it would solve nothing. Um, it would sit there very nicely in the one container that I still can't turn off um, because it's gonna be a couple of hours of downtime for me to, for me to do the migrations, right? So it doesn't help me with this. This is the thing I have to run. I could rewrite this, and that would take me probably about five or six years to do. Um, so there's a cost benefit, and in this particular case, we've chosen that it is not in our best interest to spend the, the, the time uh, to rewrite it so that we don't have those downtimes, because maybe for us, two hours of downtime every three months is acceptable for this application. Um, and that's a, that's a judgment call that we, we had to make, and we continue to have to make on a daily basis. We have a different piece of software called Node Pool, which manages the dynamic thing that I talked about. It's a bit more cloud native, um, especially in the sense that literally what it does is operate cloud resources. Um, so it's kind of hard to get more cloud native. All it does is talk to clouds. Uh, it's purpose built for this purpose in Python. Um, and it keeps a pool of ready to go nodes. So all of those clouds I was talking about, they span, uh, we, we, we have this application treat machines in across each of those clouds identically. We don't really care whether the Ubuntu trusty node comes from Vexhost or from Rackspace. We want the Ubuntu trusty node to be an Ubuntu trusty node and behave that way. Um, and so that's what NodePool does for us. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's multi-cloud uh, and allows us to treat all of those clouds as one large thing. It's also completely and fully elastic, right? So this is, this is responding when you, you know, upload a new patch into the system, um, that is going to cause VMs to be created and destroyed. Um, in fact, you can do that right now. If you patch bomb uh, Garrett, uh, it, will, it will in fact spin up and tear down uh, VMs. Uh, which is which is kind of cool, um, except when we hit quotas and, and, and then you know ultimately at the end of the day physics takes over and, and there are only so many VMs you can fit into a particular thing. Um, the reason I'm, I'm talking about all that and the thing about cloud native um, is is that I think that one of the biggest uh, benefits to cloud and why why we're all excited about it is that it allows you to run what you want, right? Um, if you want to run a 12-factor application on Kubernetes, that's fantastic. Courier is, is, is in OpenStack. It helps to integrate lib, uh, lib network from Docker in with, with Neutron. Um, so you've got, you can have your containers alongside your VMs on the same network. That's, that's fantastic. It's truly astounding, right? It's really, really cool stuff. If you want to run a traditional Java application uh, behind the NAT, you can do that in cloud. Uh, it, it'll let you. There's absolutely nothing about cloud that's stopping you from doing that. I'm doing that in production right now. If you want to run a Kerberos server, for, for the love of God, on, on the internet with an actual fixed IP and proper reverse DNS, yeah, you can do that in cloud too, and in fact, we do that. Um, and if, if, you wanted, if you wanted to get bare metal, um, because you've got some really specific things, uh, a really good example of where, uh, where this comes up is people wanting to do uh, like video transcoding using special, special hardware cards that are in the, uh, 
uh, that are in the bare metal. Great, you can do that in cloud as well. Ironic plugs into, into Nova, and you can use the exact same Nova calls to get a bare metal as you use to, to, to get a VM. And you can do all of those things, depending on which of those things makes sense for your application, for your customers, and for your users, right? And that's ultimately the thing that's the most important. Um, one final word on, on this that, that I'd like to like to get back to, um, and I have 10 seconds left, so that's probably not going to happen. Um, uh, but but I want to I want to point out again this sort of this sort of uh, uh, differentiation here with the blue people and the and the and the gray people over to the side, um, where you've got that the ops and, and the dev people and the, and the dev people only have to think about their application uh, and their application framework, and the ops people only have to think about the infrastructure. Um, with kind of my understanding that, that we've, we've made some progress uh, in the last several years, and that the DevOps is about the devs and the ops collaborating. Um, so I'm, a, I'm concerned, I don't think this is actually what they're, what they're trying to say on that previous slide, um, but I, I do concern that people, people will take, start taking things out of context and seeing this as, oh, the devs and the ops don't have to talk because devs and ops talking to each other is really frustrating and annoying. The devs can go just focus on code and don't have to worry about any of that terrible ops things. I think that takes us back a few years, right? I think, I think it's a really big progress that we've made over the last five, six years um, in, in truly understanding the power of each of these groups of people understanding each other uh, and, and building a deeper understanding. Um, and so finally, uh, in, in summary, uh, I think that Guidelines are fantastic, architectures are fantastic, uh, all of these things that we can learn about are, are great, but rigid devotion to them um, without any human judgment uh, is, is quite deadly. Um, uh, all, all of the things, all of the tools, we have such an amazing pile of tools at our disposal, um, but, but we have to apply judgment, we have to apply thinking to them, and about which ones of them actually solve the problem at hand that is important to us. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm only over by zero seconds because I don't believe it counts down uh, negatively. So, so I'm going to call that pretty good. Um, so thanks for listening to me uh, ramble.